Okay. Shalom lekulam. Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Gross. I'm a senior fellow at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem. Uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, so many people from around the world. Um, we have a, always get a good international audience for these events. Uh, for those of you that are new um, to this, this is a now regular weekly uh, Zoom event that we do on a Wednesday, uh, our English language programming um, hosted by me and bringing a, a variety of guests talking about various issues that are relevant to either to Israeli politics or the wider Middle East or the Jewish world. Or sometimes we look at historical issues or new books that have come out. Um, anyway, it's, a, it's, a, it's always a lot of fun and we get a lot of um, great guests and, and uh, we always, I always feel um, very uh, enlightened um, and more informed afterwards. So that's, um, that's really the intention. Um, so uh, before I introduce our guest, I'll just say briefly how this is going to work. Um, after I introduce him, he'll give a presentation and he and I will speak for about half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour, and then we'll go to questions from, uh, from you. Uh, you can write those questions in um, to the chat. Uh, there's a chat button at the bottom of your screen. So you can write those in uh, throughout the presentation. I'll, make, I'll be making a note of them and I will make sure to, um, uh, to go to your questions uh, and put them to our speaker. Um, so uh, we're going to be discussing today a topic which was of um, which was in the news a few weeks ago, um, certainly here in Israel, and I know also elsewhere in the world, um, the designating by uh, Israel's Defense Minister Benny Gantz of six uh, and then I think a seventh uh, NGO um, as a terrorist organizations or terrorist front organizations, um, and this was something that was. Um, roundly criticized, even condemned around the world. Um, and we're going to hear about um, really why, uh, why Israel might have felt the need to make this, um, this rather controversial uh, decision, um, and also a little bit about the international reaction. Uh, and to do that, um, I'm very uh, happy and privileged um, to have with us, um, just one second. Oh. That sometimes happens. Um, I'm very happy to have with us uh, Dr. Professor Gerald Steinberg, um, who is Emeritus Professor at Bar Ilan University and founder, importantly uh, for this topic, of NGO Monitor. Uh, his research focuses on Israeli politics, Middle East diplomacy and strategy, hard and soft power, international law, and the new anti Semitism. And he's uh, written a number of books. Uh, including the role of international legal and justice discourse in promoting the new anti-Semitism, and his most recent book, which we actually launched here at the center, Menachem Begin and the Israel-Egypt Peace Process between Ideology and Realism. He's also the recipient of the prestigious uh, Bonnet Sion and even more prestigious, I'm going to say, Menachem Begin <laughs> uh, prizes. Um, um, okay, so without further ado, Gerald Steinberg, are you with Thank us? Thank you, Paul. Good to see a lot of friends. In the audience, people I don't always get to see in person, but I see a lot of you uh, sitting out there in Zoom, virtual Zoom land. Some of you look like you're in Hawaii and other interesting places. And yeah, that's you. And uh, so this is a good opportunity to talk about the issues that I've been working on. I have to say that um, when I started working on NGOs as political actors about uh, 20 years, almost exactly 20 years ago, I thought, okay, I'll do this. I'm a tenured professor in international relations and politics. I can uh, spend a couple of years, write a few articles, maybe a book, and then I can move back to what I was doing before or onto something else. And here I am 20 years later, still very, very deeply enmeshed in uh, the world of NGOs and, and what I sometimes perhaps unfairly or at least flippantly call the NGO industry. I think it's important to realize that when I talk about the NGOs, it's a multi-billion dollar industry just in terms of Israeli-Palestinian related NGOs. This is really the, the focus. There's so much uh, obsession uh, in the NGO world uh, with Israel, with Palestinians, with uh, human rights, with other issues. And that makes, makes the work that we do, and I do it with my colleagues, NGO Monitor has a staff of about 20 people. We keep busy. We monitor on the order of about uh, 250 organizations which in all in one way or another contribute 
to the uh, allegations, the accusations, the, the, all of the, the, the proper word for this is tumult, I think. All of the uh, uh, buzz that goes on dealing with Israel via the NGO world. This, I'll go on to, I'm going to share my screen now so you don't have to watch my pretty face here. And uh, let's see, that's, I think, the right one. There it is. Uh, the focus of this evening, as, as Paul uh, so well introduced, was the uh, Israeli government's designation of now seven organizations. I'll talk about six and then seven, or set one and then six is really what it was. There's a couple of mathematicians I see in the audience, so I'll be careful. It's, it's one plus six organizations that under uh, the, um, the legal framework of the Israeli Ministry of Defense are now declared to be illegal um, terror-linked organizations or terrorist fronts, according to the findings of, of the Israeli government. And what I want to do is, is relatively briefly present what people say doesn't exist. Uh, Paul said there was a, a lot of, well, I don't forgot the expression that you said, but there was a lot of denunciation of this decision, a lot of claims and allegations that were made. And we often heard the term, no evidence, there's no evidence. Uh, we had NGOs saying there's no evidence and then we had the European governments quoting the NGOs saying there's no evidence. And then we had the NGOs quoting the European governments saying there's no evidence. I would like to present the evidence that I'm aware of, that NGO Monitor is aware of, and uh, speculate perhaps or discuss some of the evidence that the Israeli uh, that, that led the Israeli government to make its own decisions. I, I want to say, make it clear that uh, I was not, nobody at NGO Monitor was directly involved in the Israeli government decision. We were not informed in advance of, of the details or the timing or the statements that were made. We woke up, we didn't wake up, it was a Thursday night that we saw that this uh, designation had begun to appear on various social media lists. And then the documents were available on the uh, Israeli government websites and then began to put the pieces together. So I'm not, as a, I'm not a participant in the decision-making process, but I will say that we had done some of the preliminary work, which we believe had an influence on the way the decisions were made and perhaps also the timing. Uh, let me talk about the specifics. And again, all of this is readily uh, found. I think everything that I'm gonna say can be backed up, looked at, verified uh, by relatively simple Google uh, searches for the details. So it starts off with a decision made on October 22nd or an announcement of the Israeli Ministry of Defense uh, designating six Palestinian NGOs as terrorist organizations. They are specifically listed. They are based in uh, Judea and Samaria or the West Bank, depending on your, your, the language it's used. None of these organizations operate primarily out of Gaza. Some of them have branches in Gaza, but this specifically refers to the area under Israeli legal control. So since Gaza is not under Israeli control, the organizations in Gaza, some of which in our view and NGO monitors research are also part of the same network are not listed as illegal organizations, prohibited organizations by the Israeli government. I'll talk about some of these six, so I won't go reading the list. The, the key quote here is that they are operated by and for the benefit of the popular front for the liberation of Palestine, PFLP, designated as a terrorist organization by the US, the EU, Canada, and Israel. These organizations, as the chart here shows, are seen to have been, as it says, operated by and for the benefit of the PFLP. There's a problem with the definition of NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Sometimes they, the term civil society is used when the organizations themselves are very much part of the political structure. The PFLP is a constituent of the PLO. It is the, the second, the largest constituent is Fatah, the Fatah organization, which has a couple of its own NGOs. And the PFLP is this, the second largest constituent within the PLO. So they have a very clear political role within, they are the more, if you look at Palestinian organizations, sometimes the term the more radical, they do not accept the Oslo Accords. They very strongly have criticized at that time Arafat and later on uh, Mahmoud Abbas and the Fatah framework for accepting this uh, terrible um, compromise with Israel of Palestinian rights for the entire territory um, and it, entering into this uh, agreement, this compromise agreement, as they call it, with Israel. So they are on the more radical side. And it's interesting, that's also, these are the partners 
that the European governments most uh, put most of their connections with in terms of the uh, so-called NGO community. Again, the term NGO is problematic when they are really part of the, the dominant uh, coalition that runs the uh, Palestinian society and politics. Immediately after the, first of all, I, I wanna point out as, as you all, uh, so the critics know as Paul mentioned, when the Israeli government made this uh, designation of six organizations, and I'll add that in fact, in May with much less uh, fanfare, they designated the first organization, something called the Union of Health Workers Committees, uh, or the, just health, sorry, Health Workers Committees, HWC, uh, designated it in the same category as a terror organization. Uh, there was not a lot of, of um, political commentary or condemnation. It's the, it's the six, adding the six, which made a lot of uh, uh, impact. Then it becomes a network, not just a single organization, and it generated a great deal of criticism. And it's true, the Israeli government did not issue any evidentiary material. There are trials that are ongoing. There are, first, I should say, first there were arrests of some individuals. There were indictments. Some of those indictments are public and available or summaries of the indictments. Uh, but uh, the, at the time that this announcement was made, there were no details that were provided and the Israeli government, um, a few people have, a few individuals have said within the government, look, in the court context of the trials, the evidence will be presented. We are not going to interfere with that process by presenting the evidence. Of course, then critics will say, but a lot of those trials take place behind in military courts behind closed doors. So the evidence is not made public. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but that's, that's how the government works. Uh, the same thing is, is roughly true in uh, other countries as well, in, in the United States in particular, where there are terrorist trials, uh, well, not just in Guantanamo, but particularly when there are those types of tribunals and the, the process is closed, the legal process is closed. Uh, when those arrests are made by the FBI, then uh, there are cases in which evidence is not presented. Uh, so that uh, it, it's not an exclusively Israeli phenomenon. I put on the screen here, some of the just numerous examples, and they, they, you could fill hours just uh, of condemnations of the uh, of, of the uh, Israeli move, and you'll see that uh, this is shortly afterwards, within a week or two afterwards, some of them within a day or two afterwards. You see that the statements that are made: Israel moves to silence the stalwarts of Palestinian civil society. These are not unknown organizations. These are, I should say, the other round. These are well known, very. Uh, I should say, I, I can use the term highly respected among the circles that deal with human rights, Palestinian organizations. They are well-funded, all of them, all six, all seven, I'll just use the term. All seven of them receive most of their funding from European governments. They are partners with the European gov governments. And the Israeli designation also simultaneously called on European governments to stop funding these organizations. And that is one of the more uh, impactful aspects of all of this. Uh, the actual designation in and of itself does not have much of an immediate effect. Uh, it's the arrests that are based on the designation that are in, in some ways um, justified or um, legitimized by the designation. First, they make the designation, in some cases they make the arrest first, but in these cases they made the designations first and then the arrests, and then the and then with the indictments, and then after that the trials, and then after that the uh, the court decisions on the individuals that are involved. So the process has its own legal uh, framework. It's also important for me to say that the this is not a decision made by Benny Gantz, the Minister of Defense. His name he signs these papers, but he's not the decision maker in this, other than in a formalistic sense. It is the, uh, the Shin Bet, the Shabak, the Israeli security agency is responsible for determining whether the organization, whether the, to, to gathering the evidence, I should say, and presenting the case. It has to be approved by a number of levels within the uh, Israeli security legal establishment, including the attorney general. So the idea that somehow there were some uh, 
claims that were made that Benny Gantz did this for political purposes in order to improve his chances for him and his party to get elected if and when we have the next set of elections. And none of that reflects the reality of the process. It is a very detailed bureaucratic legalistic process taken behind closed doors. So it is true that it's very difficult for outsiders to be able to assess the, uh, the evidence that's provided. But so you have this very broad based uh, attack on the decision, the condemnation of the decision uh, and, and the ten, not just like this, the word tendency, the, the, the theme or the meme of referring to it as, uh, as this article that was written by the head of the New Israel Fund in the UK wrote in Fathom in response to something that I wrote and then I responded to him and they decided they weren't gonna have a second response. But he said, after failing to convince allies, it took a unilateral decision to shut down this activity, labeling human rights and civil society organizations, groups that protect and provide for vulnerable, these are wonderful organizations that protect and provide for vulnerable and marginalized people, to call them terrorists was outrageous. And the goal is to suppress the pillars of Palestinian civil society. Uh, the, some of the articles, the other articles are, are similar to that, or in, in some ways more, uh, have, have a lot of volume, but these are themes and variations. So I wanna look at the evidence that exists and uh, I will present it to you and, and everybody can make up their own mind. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna go back to May, 2021. Uh, this is often referred to because the Israeli government produced a report in the English language, which was secret but leaked. And I have to say that although many, a number of um, media platforms uh, that are associated with Israeli and other NGOs in the same political framework as these Palestinian NGOs uh, claim to have seen the report. I have not seen the report. I am basing myself on the inf information I have on, and I also can't judge its, its accuracy, but there are public statements that were made at the time of the arrest. And in some ways, this is the blueprint. The May 2021 decision, which is actually goes back to earlier uh, arrests and, and um, designations of the same organization, the Health Workers Committee. The language refers to, and the, the indictment refers to defrauding and deceiving donors. That's extremely important here, including governments and humanitarian groups via diversion of funds to the PFLP terror agenda. And the mechanisms, again, these, this is a public document. This is part of the indictment. Reporting fictitious projects, indictment and the press release. I've got the press releases on, on the corner here, the indictment is in Hebrew and, and the version that, that's been circulating is um, apparently not, it's not one that was posted by the, uh, the government itself, but uh, leaked or, or was uh, provided in a less formal way. But the language is there. Reporting fictitious projects, it's an English language. They, they had a Hebrew, English and Arabic versions of this. So this is, the, this is not a translation, not our translation anyway. This is official government translation. Reporting fictitious projects, transferring false documents, forging and inflating invoices, diverting tenders, forging bank documents and signatures, reporting inflated salaries. In other words, taking what a large amount of money, we're talking about millions of euros per year, perhaps tens of millions. It's not clear how far back this goes. And diverting it for active terrorist activities. That's what was the, that was the basis for the May 2021 indictment and claims. And it is similar to the information that we have on, on the other six in October. Uh, one of the people involved in this health workers committee, their European uh, fundraiser, a Spanish woman with a, uh, has three or four different names. I think her name is Juanita Ruiz Sanchez Rishmawi, uh, was their major European fundraiser. And she recently pleaded guilty to uh, having been involved in this and knowingly having been involved, continuing to do this after she was informed that, this, that uh, the money that she had raised was going to these uh, terrorist activities she continued to raise funds. And so therefore she was arrested, tried, uh, pleaded guilty, and um, I believe served a very short sentence and, and may have already been released. Oops, jumped too fast here. 
So to do it in more illustrated ways, this is how the, uh, the specific mechanisms, I won't leave this on very long, it's basically what I said. Uh, it's important also for me to add that uh, these organizations are very involved. All of them, uh, they, they are given the name of the human rights organizations, uh, some of them human rights, some of them involved like the Health Workers Committee and Agriculture under the framework of humanitarian aid, uh, that in addition to all the other uh, diversions of funds, they also use a significant amount of funds. This is not part of the indictment, but it's part of the, the record for um, condemning Israel, going to the International Criminal Court, the United Nations Human Rights Council, and pressing the agenda of uh, boycotts, BDS, and lawfare. I want to talk about the scale a little bit, and I said I'm getting into the evidence that we have. Now, independent and prior to what the uh, Ministry of Defense came out with and what the Shabak did, uh, NGO Monitor, we first began to look at see signs that there's a PFLP network of NGOs. We first had one al Haq that we noticed or, or observed the fact that the uh, executive director, Shawan Jabarin, had been convicted of uh, being an active member involved in the PFLP back uh, something like 20 years ago and was still limited, I won't say barred, because there were sometimes he's allowed to leave the country, sometimes he's not. Uh, it was appealed to the court. The court, the high court ruled that he was, this was go back to 2007, a Jekyll and Hyde. Um, and so we started to look at this, I'll talk more about that in a minute, but we started to look at this uh, first in 2007 with one organization, and then we found some more, and we began, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You see the pieces fit together. And as of uh, about a year ago, we had identified a network of 13 different NGOs and 70 individuals who wear two hats. Some of them, and three hats, some of them are members of more than one NGO. But all 70, more than more than 70, are both and simultaneously significant officials, board members in charge or in charge of financial administrative activities or heads of these prominent large funded, large, well-funded NGOs, Palestinian NGOs, and at the same time, they hold positions in the PFLP. And in some cases identified as actively involved in terror attacks. How do we know this? I'll show you some examples because in fact, looking at Facebook, looking at Twitter, looking at social media, they post pictures or somebody posts pictures of them at events or they're called commanders of the PFLP are heroes of operations, operations in which Israelis are killed. So these are largely through self-identification, all of which is available. Now, I, I, I'm not saying it's trivial. I have got to justify the work that our staffers are very good and nobody else has gone. The European funders never bothered to look at this. I, I think the Israeli government was aware, the Shabak was aware of some of this in general, but perhaps not the specifics until a major terror event, which I'm going to get to in a minute, in, October, in August 2019. And from our calculations, again, open sources, $200 million worth of funding has gone mainly from European governments to these 13 NGOs since 2011. So if we're right that there's a network and there are 13 such NGOs, there may be more that are transferring funds from European governments to the PFLP, that's a lot of money. That's a significant amount of money. And you can see the array of countries, including the UN, and particularly also here, I see the UN flag isn't here twice, I think, and uh, the EU and all the other donors that are contributors to this. It's really a club. And they see, okay, the Swiss government's giving them money, Germans are giving them money, then we should give them money too. And it just repeats itself without any independent uh, overview. All of this information is based on open sources. All of this has been published over the years. We had one, we had two, we had three, up until we got, as I said, to 13, seven of which are now designated by the Israeli government. And as I said, some of the, all of these are operating in the Judea Samaria slash West Bank area, not primarily in Gaza. Some of the 13, some of the other six are mainly in Gaza. And we believe that's one of the reasons they have not been designated as such, although we have reason to think and we have evidence that they are doing involved in the same kind of transfers. Here's some of the illustrations, and particularly the case of 
the PFLP cell that murdered Rina Schnerb in August 2019. In August 2019, Rina Schnerb's mother, Rina was 17 at the time, were in a, um, a spring in, um, I don't even remember exactly where the location was, and a um, bomb that had been placed there was detonated by remote control, killing her and wounding her brother and her father. This was in August 2019. A few months later, the Shabak arrested 50 individuals from the PFLP who, in one way or another, were accused of involvement in this murder. We noticed right away, looking at the names, that five of them were prominent NGO people from, as we show here, four different NGOs, uh, each one having a slightly, notice the number of people who were involved in the um, finance and administration. These are the people who control the money. In one case, we have um, uh, Khalida Jarrar in the middle, who was the, was the vice president of Adamir, uh, which is an organization that campaigns for and represents primarily PFLP prisoners who are accused and are, or, and in many cases, convicted of being involved in terrorism. So it's a, in some ways, a closed system. They are recognized and funded as a human rights organization. Uh, she was the head of the PFLP operations in the West Bank. Was, or is, I guess was, because she was arrested and held for quite a while. The uh, person who headed the, um, the attack, the commander of the, the cell is, was an accountant uh, Samir Arbid of uh, UAWC, the Union of Agricultural Workers Committee. Uh, and so each one of these five played a role. Out of the 50, they were the most prominent involved in, from the information that we have, in the PFLP cell. Some, as I said, accused, I think one of them, and I don't remember whom, uh, was, has been convicted. Uh, and a couple of others are standing trial. Um, I think, well, Khalida Jarrar was released after having served a couple of years um, in a uh, administrative, I don't remember, I, I'm not gonna remember, I don't remember if she had a trial or administrative detention, but they were all indicted and all accused of being involved in that, in that specific attack that killed Rina Schnerb. And I, I'm speculating that that also triggered a greater attention to this network by the uh, Israeli security services, by the Shabak in particular, that having, viewed the PFLP and its NGO network as not a high priority given Hamas and, and all the other terror organizations that changed with this attack. Here's another example, a prominent organization called Defense for Children International Palestine, DCIP. There are a number of individuals, some of these organizations we've identified 13 individuals among the staffers and members of the board I don't remember if this is the case for, for, PF, for DCIP or not. DCIP, Defense of Children International, speaks, is invited to speak in the US Congress, in uh, Australian Parliament, in the British uh, Parliament, uh, and in a number of other, uh, certainly in the UN and other places. They're very active, ostensibly to protect Palestinian children. They have their own uh, propaganda campaigns blaming Israel for torturing children and other things. I won't get into that now, but, but the important point is that several DCI mem IP members are directly connected to the PFLP and are identified as such. Uh, and um, including the case of uh, Hashan Abu Maria, who I believe was killed in 2014 in a shootout and uh, with, the, with the IDF and um, is acknowledged as a, a PFLP leader. So uh, you see that the, the this is all available on, on in the internet. This is from their PFLP uh, a website, identifying their, their uh, martyrs, their heroes. And um, as I said, it's all publicly available information. They don't identify them as DCIP people, but then we make the connection. We see it's the same person. They use these organizations as cover, as legitimacy. I just, I'm not gonna go through this next slide, just shows you how widely they're funded. Again, aside, this is all sorts of different European organizations that you have 2 million here and 2 million there. 
and soon the money adds up, adds up to real money, they have significant funding and from a large number of, of individual countries. Um, the la one more organization that I'll just mention quickly here, I talked about at the beginning. This is the first organization we began to look at is al Haq. al Haq is the primary, most well-known, most visible, most active organiza Palestinian organization that, out that uh, floods the International Criminal Court, the UN and other frameworks with allegations of Israeli war crimes, of apartheid, they are the premier lawfare organization. And in 2007, when the uh, Shabak said, we're not gonna let him out of the country, uh, if he leaves the country, he may return to uh, uh, recruiting for the PFLP. And uh, the high court ruled that uh, the petitioner, as the language goes, is apparently acting as a manner of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. This is our, this is a translation that uh, we did, NGO monitored from the Hebrew uh, uh, ruling, uh, but the reference is clear, referring to him as a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, some of the time as a CEO of a human rights organization, other times as an activist in a terror organization, which is involved in terror, murder, attempted murder, nothing to do with rights. Uh, Jabberin, this is, his name is Shaman Jabberin, and uh, although his PFLP connections are not that visible. There are instances in which he's photographed at a PFLP event or where he is um, labeled in uh, media reports as representing the PFLP in a broader uh, coordination meeting between the different factions uh, for political purposes. He was also a former member of the same uh, Defense of Children International group I talked about earlier. All right, here's another example. I talked about it earlier, uh, Samir Arbid, indicted for the murder of uh, of uh, Rina Schnerb, uh, and he was indicted a year later. Uh, PFLP referred to him as a prisoner and commander and one of the heroes of the Bubin operation, referring to the 2019 bombing. He, as I said, was the accountant of UAWC, held other positions within the NGO, uh, these NGO uh, network, the PFLP NGO network. So that's the evidence that we have which is not the government's evidence. It's not what uh, we have no um, clear declaration other than the indictments, which refer to this, particularly the May uh, 2021 indictment of uh, people involved with uh, and the declaration of designation of the Health Workers Committee as being another member of this of this network. Um, this is a, a tax on NGO Monitor claiming that the work that we right wing organizations like NGO Monitor. Uh, this is from one of the organizations in that network called Semidun. Baseless claims, factual inaccuracies to defend Israeli colonials and military occupation. Um, we were declared as a terrorist entity by the PLO. For some of you who uh, missed the, the news, uh, that uh, certainly gave our people, our people in our office, uh, a, a uh, certain, I won't, I won't say entertainment, it also led to increased security in the office as a result. And um, many other examples of that throughout. Uh, just what do we think should be done? We recommend strongly that governments implement, uh, implement much more uh, effective mechanisms of vetting the funding that they give uh, before they uh, just throw money at, at these NGOs. And I'll, I'll leave it at that and open this up for discussions, different points of view, et cetera. Thank you very much. That was a great, um, a great opening and, and, a, and a way for us to for us to be more um, more informed about the about the basics. Um, just I, before I go to some of the questions that have come that have come in from the audience already, um, I wanted to just it was interesting. You, you made the point very early on that it's not that even though the defense minister signs off on it, it's not his decision. It's there's there's all these levels that go up start from the from the from the Shabak investigation, attorney general, because of course the first. Um, the first NGO that wasn't part of the six was in May when it was actually a different government and a different defense minister. So there's no reason to assume that a different government, a different defense minister would have made any decision differently to Benny Gantz, right? I agree with you. Yeah, it's very unlikely. These are, the defense minister is presented with, and it's a process and it, he's probably right. briefed on it as, as it goes on. And it would not have gone to the, um, I guess the legal branch of the Ministry of Defense for their approval and certainly not to the Attorney General without having been vetted because they don't want to be embarrassed by having it being sent back. So it, it's there's a process. It's quite um, 
well-trodden, well-known. It's not something they invent. So the claim that this was, as, as you said, yeah, that this is something that had to do with an individual decision and, or political right. is not supported at all by, by the way the process works. Right. There was, um, I was reading a, a bunch of stuff before, before we, we had this uh, session and it was, I was quite surprised that there was a bit of criticism of, uh, of the decision or, or maybe not of the decision, but of, of the way it was done by, uh, even by uh, a publication like the Jerusalem Post, who they ran an editorial where they, they said that Gantz's announcement, firstly, it was done without providing any evidence. There was just a statement to the media and they thought that was problematic. And the second was that Israel didn't update its American allies beforehand. Do, what what do you what do you think about those two decisions? Not to present evidence at the at the sort of press conference and not to, to, to tell the Americans in advance. I think it's important to distinguish between the legal, technical, and security process, which is very much of a black box, right, and the political process, which, in this sense, was almost non-existent. And I think that's the problem. That I can't tell you because I don't know, and I wasn't in the room. They wouldn't tell me. Uh, to what degree they thought about this. I think I'll be start off by being not just charitable, but looking at the details. The, apparently this was re uh, announced prematurely. Right. That it was put on, they had, the foreign ministry did have a, a number of videos that a few days later they put out there. Um, but it, maybe it would have made some difference if they would have had the videos to go simultaneously, showing that basically some of the things that I talked about, but uh, also, the, later on, it was well within two or three days, it became clear that, in fact, the security service, the Shabak people, had briefed their counterparts, which I guess is the FBI hmm. or the, the counter-terror groups in Washington. But not, that did not get to the State Department spokesperson who answered and may not have gotten to the Secretary of State. So it's, it was a professional that was left inside that, that technical box and not looked at politically. My guess is, and I, it's strictly a guess, or, or my, my um, I'll say it analysis, is that the people who made this decision did not take into account, because it's not their world, that these are very influential, well-known, highly respected, all that language that's used, uh, organizations that are labeled, considered to be human rights organizations, a number of them have access. Al-Haq, for instance, is a, um, recognized by the United Nations as a civil society organization in the realm of human rights. And uh, it is the prominent, and you cannot go to a human rights council meeting in Geneva that deals with, which is every meeting, uh, when they get to the, the Israel-Palestinian uh, suffering of the Palestinian people section, item seven, you will see usually Shawan Jabarin and a, a group of uh, al-Haq uh, activists, members, officials doing side events and speaking to, huddling with delegates and writing uh, texts for speeches and resolutions. Uh, these are prominent actors. And I don't think the, that world where you see this was at all involved or consulted in the process. And uh, I, I think that, that that's, I don't know what they would have done about it had they thought about this. Right. I uh, don't know to what degree, because they're, they're very, very sensitive for good reason about letting out information on, on methods and, uh, of how they gathered the, the evidence. Uh, so that, that always becomes an issue. And that's why they do these things behind closed doors. But yeah, that, that, that is in a political sense, it was poorly handled. I think the claim that they didn't brief the Americans turned out to be inaccurate but how they briefed the americans right. and it, it could have it should have been done at a much higher level had they realized that these are big political issues maybe right, right. fair enough um one more question for me um that what about what's your response to the criticism that or the the this sort of question as to whether this is this is drawing too it's sort of using too broad a brush and saying that you know there are there might be individual staffers at these organizations that are linked to the PFLP, but that shouldn't implicate the whole NGO. I, I'm going to use the line, is it Groucho Marx, if it walks like a duck, 
talks like a duck, whatever that line comes from. Look, we, again, we're talking about open source material. We don't know, don't claim to have any independent knowledge of funding being diverted from these organizations to actual terrorist operations. We don't have any independent knowledge of who was in charge of these of terrorist attacks. What we do know is that there are over 70 individuals based on public sources in these 13 organizations. And, and the seven that I've identified have, I, I'm thinking, I'm guessing about two thirds of that have affiliations with those, um, those seven. So these are not minor actors. It's not one or two individuals. I'll take the, the most obvious one. When you have 13 individuals that hold prominent positions, these are not low level employees and receive considerable salaries from an organization. And you see this pattern repeated over and over again. I put two and two together and that's what we did. We said, these look like there's a network and it's very clever. I think it's that 20 years ago, maybe roughly 20 years ago, people from the PFLP recognized that having the cover of human rights or uh, international aid frameworks, whether it's al Haq and Adamir, or whether it's uh, the UAWC and HWC, to cover their operations and to be able to travel and raise money and do other things as a UN recognized human rights or humanitarian aid organization is, is, has a lot of benefits. And they figured that out. And that, that's not a minor issue. And they got away with it for a number of years. And they're still getting away with it because the Europeans are slowly at least admitting that there may be something that's the, the farthest as I've seen. There have been a couple of exceptions. And I do, we do know that the, um, we're talking about roughly 14 European governments, including the EU from Finland in the north, that Italy and, and Spain, all Western Europe funds these organizations. And there are, some of them have not renewed funding since the announcements were made. And some of them even before that uh, on the health workers committee, it seems to be that they were, although they said they haven't seen the evidence quietly, they're pulling back. Okay. Um, thank you. So let's go to questions from the audience. There was a question uh, quite early on from uh, Uri uh, who wanted to know why did it take so long for this to happen, especially given that the organization like NGO Monitor had had had, provide, had been producing this material for a long time. What what was why did it take so long for these organizations to be to be given this designation? My guess is, and I, I said that, and I'll expand on it a little bit. So thanks, Uri, for the question. My guess is that it was not a high priority for the Shabak. The PFLP was considered to be, and I, I heard this from individuals that, um, and it's hard for me to assess to what degree they were speaking for, for the broader security establishment, but the, the PFLP is, we can look at Hamas, you even look at, at the Fatah cells and, and organizations over the years uh, that have undertaken violent uh, terror activities. You look at um, all the factions that are working out of, uh, Gaza, like uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, there are five or six, and they have to track all of these. And the PFLP, since the days, there's a whole history, which I won't go into, but it was founded by George Habash. By the way, almost all of the, the main thrust or the main, the core of the PFLP is Christian. These are Christian Palestinians. Marxists. Right Marxist, yeah. Sorry. They were, they, were associated, they were Marxists originally. Marxists, right? exactly. We yeah. exactly said at the same time. These were Marxists back, back in the uh, 70s, late 70s, 80s. This was, that was the, the ticket, right? George nice. Habash was the founder. And they really had this because they were not Islamists. They were not, they, they couldn't buy into that. So this was their independent identity under which they could join, legitimately join the PLO. And as Marxists, they be, were also more critical more radical in condemning any kind of, of compromise, pragmatic compromise, which they, they saw Fatah is doing under the Oslo framework. So if for all, I think the view was that they were dormant. That's to answer the question, uh, that they were dormant for many years. Now, I could, in retrospect, I would argue against that, but I think the sense was it's just not worth the, the resources to go after these people. And maybe it was better. Uh, this is a complete speculation on my part. 
And if lightning strikes, then you know that I'm way out of line here, that maybe it was just easier to let them do the work and monitor the, the small handful of people who are identified as activists in PFLP. And then came the Rina Schneer bombing. There were a few others that took place, other attacks that took place, uh, but the Rina Schneer bombing, I think was an indication that this organization still had, and or either revived or still had capabilities and what was a threat and that got it higher up on the, uh, on the agenda. Right, I wonder also because, um, because there's a clampdown on Hamas in the West Bank by the PA, it kind of leaves the door open more for the PFLP to be more, more active. Um, the other way around, by the way, it might also be more competition. If, if there's more um, terrorist activity, more piguim on the part of Hamas than to keep right. up, the PFLP has to put up its own flag. It's right, important. Right. These are all competing political factions. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, there was a question from Svi. Uh, it was a straightforward question. He asked, what are the practical ramifications of designating an NGO as a terrorist organization? Primarily, it provides the um, military government and the military in general with the ability to make arrests, to, to run raids, to confiscate uh, computer and, and other and documentation. Uh, that, that's the immediate impact. They, they could go further. They could also use it to, and we haven't seen this yet, to uh, make it illegal for them to raise funds or pay salaries. And that has not been done. Again, these are designated only for operations within the West Bank, within, I'm always careful to be political, Judea and Samaria. Uh, it does not cover Gaza, and there are always questions. Well, they they, they can and, and some of the groups there's a there are different branches. Uh, the Health Workers Committee has a mirror image in, in Gaza, which continues to operate, as far as I know. Um, different people uh, and different they they get funded separately in terms of the the designation. Uh, I guess I assume to different bank accounts and all that. So. Um, it makes it uh, makes it possible legally for without having to go through getting warrants and other things once these groups are, are designated for the military to act and, and for uh, indictments, arrests, and all of the rest. Okay. Um, this question here, which is it's kind of a broader question, I guess, about the work that NGO Monitor does and 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 this whole this whole the whole sort of theme of of tackling these kinds of NGOs. And the question is, is should Palestinians, should Palestinians be free to pursue legal and civil society campaigns against Israel, including boycotts, if it doesn't involve violence? And if not, then how does that chime with freedom of speech, democracy, and well, those issues? I would call that a leading question, right? I can't say not, right? <laughs> of course, every civil society organizations should be free to make whatever claims it wants and as long as it's short of uh, incitement to violence which is an issue right but this is not what we're talking about first of all we're talking about direct involvement in terrorism right not about their political agendas which i don't like but it doesn't mean that they're not free to, to have those agendas right the second level of this is should european governments right the funding and, and they're my emphasis, NGO monitors, emphasis on providing the information. I personally don't think that the Israeli government should uh, impose limitations by law. There are uh, proposals in the Knesset to make it illegal for various organizations, including both Israeli and Palestinian groups, to raise, raise money. That's not what we're talking about here. Okay. Um... The question from uh, Shmuel Yerushalmi, uh, who says that um, what's the connection? He, he, what's the connection to terrorism of the organization of Palestinian agricultural workers and of women's organizations of Palestine? I think he, what, how you know? I think it's, it's, there's kind of a disconnect to sort of the what are organizations that are doing that kind of work? How what's the connection with with terrorism? Look, the title of the organization and what they claim to do and what some of them actually do is 
independent largely of whatever else they do. I, I, that didn't come out very articulately, but in other words, there's a facade out there and, and even more than a facade. The U Union of Agricultural Workers Committees is a, I've forgotten what their budget is, but they get a lot of money because they give farmers or people who claim to be farmers money to uh, buy, to buy equipment to, to hmm. do all sorts of agricultural stuff. In addition to that, the um, they are involved in terror. Some of them are involved in terrorism. And that goes back, by the way, to one of your earlier questions about a few individuals. If those individuals are the leaders of the organization, board members, uh, accountants, and they siphon off money and then they themselves plant bombs and trigger the bombs and all of that, that has nothing to do with the, the cover of being UAWC. It's the fact that once you have a lot of money going in and very little supervision or due diligence, then it's easy to siphon off and, and do these other things. Is it a cover? Maybe the, you know, the, one of the images is, and, and um, I'm careful, one of the perceptions or hypotheses is, I don't have any access to any court evidence yet, but that's certainly among the allegations and the indictment, that they use this simply to get, to get to salaries and to divert funding. They get high salaries. The heads of these organizations are well paid. In fact, there's quite a bit of criticism within the Palestinian um, civil society, including, by the way, academics. I've got a pile of articles and books written, some of them in English. Those are the ones I read, not the Arabic gets somebody else to go through, criticizing these barons of the Palestinian NGO industry who are paid by Europeans and get very nice salaries and have cars and able to afford all sorts of other things that other people aren't able to afford. And so it, it's, a, it's a very useful cover for in a number of purposes. Right. Um, so th there's, a, there's a few questions which are kind of on a similar theme. Um, Elliot, Elliot Green is asking specifically about Ireland. Um, I'm not sure if he's from Ireland or has a connection to Ireland, but why Ireland continues to be skeptical, especially as NGO Monitor has, has provided information in the past. And, and Moshe Dan asked a, asked a similar question about the EU generally, why the EU isn't taking these, these, this situation seriously or doesn't seem to be believing what you are presenting and perhaps what the Israeli government is now presenting. And then finally, Jacqueline asks if the, why the UN is not okay. getting so involved got... in, in this stuff. If, you will have to remind me, I didn't write that. I could write this down, but I'll just... Uh, Ireland, EU, Ireland, UN. okay. So Ireland is ground zero. The EU, then it goes, well, I'll make it more complicated. And I'll explain why in a minute. I'll start with Ireland. Then I'm going to go to the Netherlands and Belgium. And I basically treat them as one unit in terms of their, their um, links to ties and, and embrace of these organizations. And then from there to the EU and then from there to the UN. I'm gonna start, and it's gonna be brief. Each one of these, I've written articles about it and we have tons of stuff. Ireland, for all sorts of political reasons, particularly, obviously, the, the Protestant uh, Catholic divide or however, uh, Republicans and, and uh, Unionists, all of that. And uh, Paul, you probably, are, well, anybody who follows Irish politics knows that <coughs> you have Palestinian flags and, and Israeli flags that yeah. they very much, involve themselves in our conflict and adopt their, their favorites. So the uh, Republican side, which includes certainly the Republic of Ireland, very sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. And uh, there are a number of people from al Haq with degrees, people who have worked at al Haq. I, I believe even uh, Shaman Jabarin has a degree from um, the University of Galway, I think, and they have a human rights center there. It's really a, a, a center, of, I was cynical, I would use the word factory, so that uh, they churn out the very sympathetic, uh, William Shavis, who was the head of one of the committees until he turned out to have not filled out his form properly. Um, somebody's either clapping her hands or killing a mosquito. Uh, the, uh, was uh, from the UN back in 2014 that denounced Israel for war crimes. Uh, he had an academic position for a number of years and, and I believe uh, helped to, the process of, of churning out these uh, um, degrees for Palestinians, particularly al Haq. So there, there's a close connection there. Just as one example of how Ireland is very much involved in this process. In some ways, you could say these are their organizations. Not, not that they, they are the only supporters, but they're very closely involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you see by looking at the histories and looking at the details, 
how closely there, there's a new book that came out uh, on the history of Al Haq, written by a woman who um, her name is Welshman, <coughs> who was an employee at Al Haq for a number of years. I'm not sure if she was married to or is married to a Al Haq official, but there was the various connections, and she, she gives a very friendly history which includes the Irish connection in there. This is how wonderful the organization is and traces the, the process from, from the 70s where it began to develop its European connections. Ireland played a central role. That's a long answer, but it's important to see how closely tied the individuals the, or the, the, these NGOs are, these Palestinian NGOs, these specific Palestinian NGOs and their European patrons. It goes back many years. It goes back to student days where you had delegations of students and young faculty going back and forth to Beer Zayt University and, and signing agreements and getting funding from their governments. The Netherlands comes in very close to Ireland in terms of these kinds of connections. And by the way, this is extremely important because it goes back to the other point. Good thing I remembered it. The, the Christian connection, the, the religious, the churches were among the first organizations to provide the support they would sponsor tours of uh, exchanges between these individuals and then that help foster the funding, which led to the development of the NGOs. This is a whole big speech, which I covered an article I just published uh, in the um, what's called Strategic Assessment, which is published by uh, the uh, um, Israeli, the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv, uh, close to uh, the Statue of the University. Uh, it's, a, it's a relatively long article and eventually will be part of a book, I hope. So I trace all of this. So that, excuse me for being overly detailed, but this is, it really hits an important nerve here. From the Netherlands and from Ireland and then the individual other countries, the EU, back in um, 1995, they held something called the Barcelona Conference and they started to fund NGOs and the first NGO, because this was going to bring peace. I won't go into all of that detail, but they put a, a lot of money into it. Then the EU, they had to find partners and well, who are the partners? Well, the Netherlands thinks these groups are great. So let's give them some money too. And then it went on, Swiss, the Swiss came in and the Norwegians, and then it just from top to the bottom where you have almost every European country giving money to these same NGOs and without anybody questioning what they actually do because, well, the Irish gave the money and then the Netherlands gave, and then the EU gave the money and then it's a, it's a chain process. The UN is in part a part of that process. And in a certain sense, also, it has its independent methods of reinforcing, because in the U UN, you also add the prominence of the uh, Arab League, the organization of the Islamic uh, of Islamic cooperation. They're the people who helped bring us the uh, Durban conference back in 2001, one of my earlier web seminars uh, and the NGO forum, which which launched BDS and uh, all the lawfare campaigns. These same NGOs were right there on the ground and pushed through these, these agendas and then got funded partly by usually what happens in the UN, it's much harder to trace, although they're beginning to be more transparent. So that also adds that, that whole UN element to that uh, with the backing also, not just of the European governments, but also of the, uh, uh, the Islamic bloc, which is now the largest single bloc in the UN with the demise of the um, non-aligned movement. But, but we know, I mean, the, the, we, we've seen that the that the EU, and I don't know if, about individual EU countries, but certainly the EU as an institution, seem to reject what the Israeli government has presented. And I know the NGO Monitor has had many many meetings with EU officials um, presenting it. So so what what do they tell you? I mean, what's what what is their what's their reasoning for not stopping the funding or or at least um, doing their own investigation? It's very hard to tell. You know, I had this conversation. It was publicized. The uh, Irish foreign minister was here. Right. Um, roughly around the same time, I believe the end of October, early November, right after the, and he said that, and I know that the EU delegate delegations all had a meeting uh, to discuss what their policies would be. And he just said what we've talked about before. He said, we are not convinced. We have not been shown any evidence and we are not convinced that this is a real Issue. I, I don't want to. I don't have the exact quotes, but he, it was on the record. Uh, and, and in my view, this is again the close relationship that that they have 
with the, the individuals, the leaders of the organizations. It shows the, the influence, the power, and the, um, the, the kavod, the honor, or the, uh, yeah. the way that they're considered. It, it's, it, it's, they meet, you look at the, um, the Facebook and, and Twitter feeds of the European representatives. Even a few days ago, the, um, the European um, the term, it's the ambassador, the head of the delegation in Ramallah to the Palestinians uh, met with representatives of these six organizations and, and declared their support, solidarity. And you say, How? this is a week ago, right? The campaign, but, and, but it's because there's so much money and such close ties, they're very reluctant to see the evidence, to open their eyes. And I think it will happen because I think that the evidence is overwhelming. We see what happens, and I just, I'll just i add what wasn't asked, what happens next. And in, in a number of parliaments, questions have been asked by the opposition. Why are you giving them money? In the case of the Netherlands, the uh, at the time, the Minister of International Aid uh, announced that uh, having seen that, in fact, Dutch money was used to pay the salary of Samir Arbid, who was the uh, uh, considered to be the head of the um, cell that uh, planted the bomb and detonated it that killed uh, uh, Rina Schnerb, and they froze the money. Uh, and it's going to continue in each government to be raised. There are articles in some of the newspapers that don't take the no evidence line uh, uh, for granted. So I think that it'll be more difficult for them to maintain that position. But I see this as just continuity, that having this relationship, which goes back 20 years, it's very hard to admit we were wrong. And that's, that's a key aspect. It's not yeah, that we yeah. were wrong last week or we might have been wrong a year ago when we gave the money. We've been doing this for 20 years and it's not just that we're giving them money. They are part of our decision-making and policy-making process. Mm -hmm. We develop our policies based on the cooperation with these organizations. Right. It would be, and they'd have to almost start again in terms of the relationship with Palestinians. And again, these, they don't say this, but these are the Christians these are the people who have the church connections. These are the people that we can work with. Right. Well, that's really interesting. It's the the that that sort of long term relationship and the the almost sort of intertwined of the of the of the workings, at least in terms of the Israeli Palestinian arena. That that to 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 cut that off would be not only admitting that they'd been funding these these terrorist fronts for X number of years, but also that they would then have to have to re uh, sort of start from scratch because they wouldn't be able to rely on these organizations anymore. Um, also, <laughs> I'm wondering also whether it's sort of, we should be surprised given that the EU, given how reluctant the EU is to, to label Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, <laughs> uh, sort of an unequivocal terrorist organization. Um, yeah, the so, friction between the military wing and the political wing, yeah, which this, I've also yeah, this, heard on occasion, you know, the PFLP doesn't really claim to have that distinction. I've heard right. a few, uh, Diplomats use that. By the way, I just want to add, we talked about Europe. It's important for me to say this. Uh, NGO Monitor, we do research, right? So we just found, uh, by going through the UN funding for these organizations, all of a sudden there's a big chunk of money from Canada. The Canadians did not give the money to the UAWC. This is not like a European government. It's not a grant. The Canadians gave the money through the UN into a, a project which is run by Oxfam Italy. Just shows you how the money gets twisted around. And I, I've forgotten the amount, but it's over a million Canadian dollars that ends up going to the UAWC. And from the correspondence, apparently, what they say is that the, um, what they call global affairs, the Canadian foreign ministry said that they, they, had, they answered a question, said we, none of our money is going to any of these organizations because they didn't know. They just, they give the money and then they close their eyes. They don't follow up where it goes because this is humanitarian aid for Palestinians. We don't have to vet them and check them out. We don't have the capacity to do that. Okay, um, we're, we're a little over time, but there's one more question, which I think I wanna ask just because I think it's, 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 a, it's a very important question, which I think will probably be in, on a lot of people's minds, which is about the media. Um, and the question is very specifically, from someone called MC, I'm sorry, I don't have your full name here. Um, how do you deal with the New York Times, BBC, Guardian, and others who dismiss your reports and others as right-wing Israeli propaganda and therefore continue to spread these stories? I guess the correct answer is uh, we grit our teeth. We try not to get into fights with journalists. Uh, occasionally, I will have, some of us will have off-the-record conversations. 
occasionally I will uh, loosen my uh, self-imposed restraint and, and respond on Twitter. Uh, sometimes I did submit a, a piece to the New York Times countering one of their op-eds and they told me, thank you very much, but we've already run pieces like this. And uh, so it, it, it's a difficult relationship. I, you know, it's just, what I said about the European diplomats applies to some degree also to journalists. And on uh, this, I will quote Matty Friedman, mm. uh, so some of you may know is he's a really a brilliant writer who worked for the AP back in uh, the, the period of the, the Gaza war of um, cast lead, mm. I believe in, in 2009. And he later wrote an article in the Atlantic yeah. first in tablet and then the Atlantic about how mentioning Gerald Steinberg and Monitor was taboo. We were censored by the, the AP and I, it's, it's more broad. It's, it's, we know now it's, it's much broader than that because we're against the, the, the party line and the closeness that, that the NGOs have to, or the journals have to their um, NGO sources and to their colleagues. Yeah, that it's right. I remember, um, I think in that piece, Manny Freeman said that, that, you know, he, he, he pointed out the absurdity that, that you could, you could talk to any number of, of, you know, sort of pe people from Hamas or, 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 or any extremist group on either side, in fact, even it's it also Jewish extremist groups, but you couldn't talk to Gerald Steinberg or NGO. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we encounter that kind of censorship in lots of different frameworks, right. including, by the way, with some, uh, some diplomats, some governments or some governmental frameworks, I was told, have a, a ban on, on meeting with us, which, uh, oh. and then we say, well, then don't be surprised if we issue a report that makes you look bad. We, we yeah. offer to brief you and to get your comments before we publish. Anyway, yeah, right. it's a never ending story because we're, we're, we're against the, the standard line. It's the, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance for those people who study psychology or whatever field the cognitive dissonance, uh, dissonance is uh, defined as these days. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's right. And um, look, this is a story that is going to, I'm, I'm sure we'll continue and we'll probably hear more about it once, once the, once court cases have been, have run their course. Um, so it's going to be more in the news and, and maybe we'll have you back to, to talk about what's going on then as well. Um, but thank you very much for, um, for explaining some of these rather um, opaque, um, opaque details and situations for us. Uh, much appreciated as always. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm just writing my, my email into the, into the zoom because, um, uh, some of you aren't, aren't on my mailing list and perhaps you would like to be and to get more information about the English language stuff that we're doing, including all these zooms that we've been, uh, that we've been doing on a weekly basis. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you, Professor Gerald Steinberg, as usual. Thank you, Paul. Thank you all for spending the time. Appreciate and it. And I will, uh, I, I hope to see you all uh, next week. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye. Good night.